welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. Each week, our in-house experts sit down with special guests to discuss depictions of World War II on film. Sit back and get ready for a lively debate that will reveal the good and bad of how Hollywood shows the 20th century's most dramatic event. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. And today our special guests are Colin Makemson, Assistant Director of Education for Curriculum. Thanks for having me. Kaylee Martin, historian. Hey, Seth. And Dr. Ed Lingle, Senior Director of Programming here at the museum. Great to be here. Today we'll be discussing the 1977 film Cross of Iron. The film focuses on a German infantry platoon on the Eastern Front, specifically in the area of the Kuban Bridgehead in 1943 during the German retreat. Rolf Steiner is a combat-hardened veteran of many campaigns, and he leads his platoon through the hell of the Eastern Front with his main goal, that of keeping as many of his men alive as possible. Steiner's real enemy, however, is not the Soviets, but the aristocratic Prussian officer named Stronsky, who only seeks to glorify himself and do something heroic enough for which he would be awarded the Iron Cross. Cross of Iron stars James Coburn as Steiner, Maximilian Schell as Stronsky, James Mason, David Warner, and many others. The film is directed by Sam Peckinpah, written by Julius Epstein, James Hamilton, and Walter Kelly. Cross of Iron received mixed critical reviews at the time of its release, but has since been viewed as both an important and well-made film. And before we get started, I want to add that Cross of Iron is currently available to stream on Amazon, and it's also available on DVD and Blu-ray. So uh, as we get started on this, like we normally do, Colin, I'm going to start with you Mm -hmm. and your opinion. How accurate is Cross of Iron? Well, it's, it's... Chaotic and hard to follow, so that sort of fits with the the Eastern Front fighting, especially the German retreat. It, it definitely fits Peckinpah's dir- directorial directorial style as well. It's you know really brutal with excessive violence, and it's really nihilistic, and you don't really get a sense of what anyone's fighting for or doing out there. The Germans are sort of beaten as a cohesive fighting force. They're drunk and disorderly. They're wearing Soviet attire and headgear. Uh, they're really doing whatever they want. So they're beaten and broken down as uh, a lot of the soldiers were making that retreat. Kaylee, what about you? Yeah, I mean, considering that it's based on a um, fiction book, um, but it's based on true story, I think it's pretty good. The gear's pretty good. The weapons are pretty good. So um, I was kind of surprised, actually, by how good some of that stuff was. What about you, Ed? There are some uh, occasional amusing missteps, such as the uh, uh, U.S. Navy Corsairs uh, bombing the uh, German troops on the Eastern Front. So those are always amusing. I, I like the the uh, the chaos, the slow motion explosions, the voice actor shrieks uh, with every bomb that explodes. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons this movie interested me because I have read the novel The Willing Flesh by Willy Heinrich uh, came out in 1955, which is, I think, a fascinating novel. Uh, so it's interesting to see how this movie handles that. Yeah, I think it's it has its accurate points and it has its inaccurate points. I mean, like again, like we've said a hundred times on like any World War II movie or any war movie period, but I think visually it's pretty accurate for the Eastern Front for this particular time of the year or for time of the war rather. And you know, like you mentioned, Kaylee, the, the gear and the, and the weapons. It's really notable for having not a hundred percent accurate weapons, but pretty dang close. Uh, I think that some of the Soviet soldiers have uh, M44 carbines, which didn't see action at this time of the war. But you know, whatever, it's pretty damn close. And uh, you know, they they do have a lot of the accurate weaponry in there, and the, and the uniforms are accurate. And then, you know, Colin, to your point, the way you said that, uh, or when you said that, some of the Germans are wearing Soviet uh, articles of gear and clothing. And I, you know, to a point, that's accurate too. You know, I think uh, you see you look at pictures of of Eastern Front, especially at this time, forty three, and, and even later, even so much too. You know, there's a lot of Germans that are, they're especially weaponry. You know, it, capturing a, a, a scoped out Moise and Nagant ninety one thirty was a <laughs> favorite pastime <laughs> of, of a lot of German soldiers, or the SVT forty, or the or the um, PPSH forty one that you see uh, Steiner using later mm-hmm. on in the movie. That that was a common occurrence on the Eastern Front, so much so that actually you know you see some PPSH forty ones and and Soviet weapons on the Western Front in Normandy because they captured them in so many you know numbers and some of these veterans who fought on the east in the east brought them over to the west so to a point that's accurate too you know so uh, you know it has its its high points and low points and to your point of the Corsairs coming in to <laughs> to conduct strafing runs on the Germans 
you know, we did do shuttle runs with our B-17s from England all the way to Soviet uh, Russia, but pretty sure that no carrier aircraft can make a flight that long. <laughs> but as a, as a tank guy, I liked the uh, T-34s. As I understand this was filmed in Yugoslavia. Uh, I'm not quite sure where they got this equipment from, but you have to imagine the Yugoslav army, which probably had some vintage uh, World War II equipment, may have helped out on this. I read, actually, they kept a few around just for filming purposes. For when productions would come through and want to film, they had two available for that. Yeah. Right. They ser- it certainly looks the part, you know, that in some of those, uh, the, the larger attack sequences where the, where the Soviets are coming at the German fixed fortification, or not fortification, fixed positions. Um, it certainly looks like what, you know, what you see in the newsreels and, and what you read about and some of the imagery that you see so it certainly looks, it definitely looks good. That's yeah. for sure. I agree. Well, um, uh, we mentioned Sam Peckinpah. Director Sam Peckinpah was notorious for his explicit depiction of action and violence. And one has to think that he was chosen for this purpose, in this, for this movie, that is. Did he succeed in capturing the violence in the, on the Eastern Front during the Second World War? Ed, what do you think about that? As, as Colin was pointing out, the the kind of the chaotic violence of the of the Eastern Front, I think Peckinpah captures quite well, and the the sense of uh, action uh, in a battle where way too many filmmakers give in to kind of a scripted idea of how you present battle, where you can understand all the different stages in the beginning and the end. I think Peckinpah was right and. In depicting it more as a as a free for all, where it, the soldier's point of view is really quite narrow, it, it's it's hard for him to see any more than what's happening immediately around him. So, given the giving allowances for the excesses, again the the slow motion explosions, one after the other, um, the the bodies flying through the air and their contortions becomes kind of comedic after a while. But uh, if you allow for that, I thought it's, he did a good job. But you, Kaylee? I agree, uh, especially I think when you look at the little young Russian boy that's captured by the Germans at the beginning of the film. And, you know, you can understand they kind of take sympathy on him, especially as you see their attitudes as the film progresses and where they are that they wouldn't want to kill this kid. And then that sadness of they send him back and his own side opens up on him, knowing full well, I am, I believe, who he was. Um, or and I think what, that, he, what he was. Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, yeah, regardless of which side he's on, they don't hesitate. And I think that's that, that violence and that just not caring. Um, also interesting that they include female Russian soldiers. Mm-hmm. And that was which just accurate. accurate. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was an interesting inclusion. What you call I don't know, there's that true folk quote about you can't make an anti-war war film. You'll always make the war end up looking like fun. Uh, and I think Peckinpah may have made one of the few anti-war war films because this doesn't look like any fun at all. It's, you know, it's horrible. There's no dignity. There's no purpose. Uh, the soldiers don't know what they're fighting for. They're just out there. Or at worst, they're uses kind of pawns in, you know, Stronsky's climb up the ladder to, to get himself advanced. Uh, and it's just, you know, the masses being led to slaughter by the, by the upper class and for what? And for muddy trenches and, uh, you know, cheap booze. Yeah, you know, I mean, the overall violence of the movie, and it is, I mean, if you've ever seen any of Peck and Paw's stuff, you know, the Wild Bunch comes to mind. Um, the violence in there is, is just as gritty in Wild Bunch as it is in in this movie here. And to a point, you know, I mean, obviously it's a war movie, so I mean, you know, people generally don't die uh, peaceful, happy deaths in, in, in any sort of combat situation. They die, you know, horribly all the time. Oh, almost all the time. 99.999% of the time, they die horrible horrible deaths and you do see that you get Mm -hmm. that idea in this movie however there are times in the film where i think it is a bit it's like oh come on (laughs) it's like come on get it over with and the slow motion Mm -hmm. stuff initially while it comes out is kind of cool you know it's like okay you know there but then you know there are some scenes and kaylee you and i had discussed this you know a, a day or so ago that that are unnecessary in in terms of the slow motion like i'm thinking of the one where steiner's dropping the magazine out of his mp40 
and in this one fluid, and it does look cool. <laughs> it is sexy looking where he just whips that magazine out, which is a non-regulation magazine carrot, but, you know, dorkness there. <laughs> and he pulls it out and slaps it back in the 40 and racks the bolt back, and he's ready to roll. And that's all done in slow motion. And while it looks very, very cool, it's like, what's yeah. the point of that, man? Just reload the weapon and go. He could have given Stronsky some, uh, some pointers on reloading the MP40, which is the easiest weapon in the world to reload. But that's besides the point. But um, the violence in it, I mean, it certainly adds to the realism of the movie, but I think it can get a little bit excessive, you know, with the slow motion stuff, like like, like Ed was saying there. It's like a music video. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Saxon or Def Leppard playing in the background or something, you know? I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe. Iron Maiden, yeah. yeah. yeah Iron Maiden, sure. yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, overall it's good. And, I mean, as far as the violence on the Eastern Front is concerned, and, uh, I mean, that was a war. Yeah spelled w-a-r i mean that was a war in which there was no quarter asked none given by either side so i mean you know the fact that the kid does get killed by his Mm -hmm. own people that was a common occurrence for the soviets and the germans too for that matter and and, you know the fact that the women are slaughtered for the most well Mm -hmm. not all of them but i mean a bunch of them are shot in that house and you know they don't even give second thought that they just killed a bunch of women that is a common thing on the eastern front and you know the retribution is taken on the rapist in there you know certainly would have happened probably in a far worse situation than actually occurred in the film but um it does a good job i think i think it does a good job anyway um, the soundtrack of this film is by the famous composer Ernest Gold, an Austrian-born American. Why do you think he chose the songs at the beginning and the end? And, of course, we're talking about the, the children's song, Hunchen Klein. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my own theory on this, but uh, what do you guys think? Um, I mean, if you pay attention to the lyrics, it's about a young boy who leaves home, comes back years later, and his family doesn't recognize him. So with that in mind, to me, it's a perfect... Um, description of young men going to war and returning in a state that their families no longer recognize them and I think that that's what you're seeing in the film so when you when you actually look at the lyrics and read the lyrics it's a perfect description of what you're about to see it's almost a Stephen King touch yeah really is the loss of innocence and the contrast of Mm -hmm. of childhood and extreme violence yeah. It's a perfect song for for Steiner. You know, he has a chance to go home uh, from mm-hmm. the hospital, and he's just like, "No, nah, I'm too far gone. I'm going to go back with my hop on the truck and go back with my go back with my men." And I'm sure he'd be you know, unrecognizable to any family that he had returning to. Yeah, and I mean, he's he's visibly happier when oh, yeah. he gets back. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, when he's in the beginning of the movie, when he's out there, you know, doing that that initial patrol where they wipe out that that mortar section there. And they go back, and that's when they capture the kid. And then they go back to the to the dugout. And, and, you know, he's just, they all look like these miserable human beings. And then, you know, the, the movie progresses, and he gets even more miserable as the movie goes along. And then he gets, I, I'm assuming, you know, he might, might have taken some shrapnel, but it's really it's blast concussion yeah. that, that he suffers. And, and that's why he's having those trippy dreams and everything. But he's in the hospital, and he's got clearance to stay in the hospital for a little while longer with a nurse whom he is clearly shacked up with. And go home. And yet he bails on that to get back to the front, to get back with his people. And when he jumps in the truck, I mean, he's noticeably happy. Like he's smiling, smacking each other on the back of the shoulder. And, you know, and he gets back to the front and he sees his boys and they're all elated to see him. And he's just as happy to see them. So that has become, you know, it's sometimes it can be cliche. But in this movie, I think it was one of the first, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that actually shows this, that those were clo- those guys were his family now even if he had a wife and son or whoever or mother father whatever these people are closer to him than any kind of family and i think that's universal when it comes to any kind of warrior mentality you go to you know you fight with these people you live and die with these people and they become closer than brothers and and not to say band of brothers haha but it's true it's it's very very true and it exists to this day it probably goes all the way back to you know Hannibal, but it, it's 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 very very true. It rings true. Uh, I think of the uh, parallel in the First World War, the British uh, soldier Siegfried Sassoon, who um, was forcibly put in a mental hospital in 1917 for protesting the course of the war. He was put in Craig Lockhart, and he just couldn't stand it anymore. And just desperately, much as he hated the war, he had to be back with his men. He couldn't bear to be away from them. Uh, so that is that is a common experience. Yeah. 
And in the song, I think it, you nailed it, Kaylee. But everybody did really. I mean, it, it's you know, it, you think of not so much private deeds. So he's he's the youngest and the most uh, innocent of the German soldiers that are there. But like you said, you know, the guys who leave home, they are not the same people that return. You know, even if they're physically untouched or relatively physically untouched. Those are completely different human beings. And the song is, you know, the fact that it's in German, you got to look it up and you got to figure out what it, what it means. And most people probably don't do that. But it's kind of disturbing <laughs> when the movie oh, yeah. starts off and you hear these children singing and you see pictures of, of you know, the, the Nuremberg rallies and all <laughs> kinds of stuff that's going on in there. And it's, it's kind of like it's a shock to the senses, mm-hmm. really, when you see it and then you hear it. And yeah. It's kind of haunting all the same. Yeah, and in the lyrics, he's the, it starts out, Hunchen is an affectionate nickname for Hans. And it's something you would call a young boy. And then as the song progresses, he becomes Hans. So you see this from a boy to a man. And it really is so representative of that experience that not only the guys who went to war, but their families at home, they send their little boy off and he comes back this man changed by this experience. And uh, just a silly factoid, but uh, uh, Ernest Gold's uh, son was also became a musician. Uh, so if anyone plays trivia at a bar, he wrote the theme for the Golden Girls. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> another powerful song. <laughs> thank you for being Maybe, my friend, Colin. Friend. Friend. I appreciate it. You got it. Oh, goodness. All right. Anyway, uh, let's discuss the pros and cons of telling a story like this from the German perspective. This is 1977. You know, I don't think this movie would have been made in 19... 19- 48, shall we say. And uh, those kind of movies are few and far between anyway, even today. You know, I can name, I'm sure we can all name a couple, but not very many. But what what's, what are the pros and cons of telling a story like this from, from that specific perspective? There are a lot of things to say about it, but uh, I think there's one interesting decision here that the filmmakers made. It seems to me that Peck and Paul consciously modeled parts of this film after the great 1930 film uh, All Quiet on the Western Front by Lou Ayers, which is from the German perspective. And the the battlefield panoramas uh, seem to me to be very close to what uh, what appeared in that film, which was a gra- groundbreaking film. And in the 1930 film, the, the filmmakers made the decision, you're going to show American actors in German uniform, but instead of having them try to mimic German accents, they just talk with standard American accents, uh, which was really pretty shocking for audiences at the time. In this movie, Cross of Iron, I don't know if, if there's one artificial note here. It's it's Coburn and James Mason um, and uh, David Warner trying to mimic German accents. Of course, it comes across naturally from Maximilian Schell and some of the others, but it, it strikes to me kind of an off note um, because they are acting and sometimes their voice acting isn't that great. It's, it's hard to connect with them in the same way. Uh, I'd be curious what you all think of that. I, I think David Warner's absolutely the worst. Yeah. Like his accent. I mean, he's a, he was, he's a good actor, but his, his, his accent in this movie, it is so, I mean, it. Captain Kiesel. Yeah. He screams British. I mean, it's not even close. And James Mason, who is, was a fine actor. I mean, in some fantastic movies, North by Northwest comes to mind, you know, I mean, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. He's a great actor. He just, he just doesn't pull it off either. Yeah. You know, Coburn actually, I, th- I think, just my personal opinion, does the best job of the three. Mm-hmm. But, um, Kiesel uh, Warner, yeah, he's 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 just, this is just and the hair, man, his hair, that is 1977 hair if there ever was. It, yeah, I do find it it is distracting because you kind of can forget that they're supposed to be German, and I think it's interesting that they have them sing in German quite mm-hmm. often, mm-hmm. and so they're trying to remind the audience that they are Germans, but with those poor accents, it is kind of a disconnect there, definitely. But I, th- I think that goes to the, to the accuracy of the film, too, you know, with the Germans singing. Because that mm-hmm. was something that the German army yeah. did. I don't know if they still do, but they certainly did in World War One and World War Two, especially World War Two. You know, wherever they marched, they sang. And even when they weren't marching, they were singing. You know, it was it was something that was instilled in them in, in, in their training. And they were encouraged to do or ordered to do so. And uh, I, I do as I am ordered and, and just go through singing all across Europe, you know, it was a world tour, if you will, European tour of singing. But that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a neat little point of accuracy in the film that I think that, you know, if you didn't know that, you'd be like, why the hell are these guys singing all the damn time? Well, it's because that's what they did. 
And I wonder if there are some moral challenges here in terms of making the Germans appear a bit too sympathetic. And, um, you know, I, th- I thought that there were clear parallels being drawn with Vietnam by, by Peck and Paul, but, uh, you know, trying to present the German Wehrmacht as being many of in Steiner's company were, were sympathetic figures who were not, not Nazis. They didn't like the war. They were real working class types who were bucking against the system and their officers who were elitist aristocrats and or Nazis. Uh, I don't know. It, it kind of helps perpetuate a myth that there were there were good Germans who were the bulk of the German forces who were victims. Uh, and this is something that comes out of the 1955 novel. But then there were the bad Nazis, whereas the, the real boundaries were not quite so clear in reality. Yeah, it's that myth of the clean Wehrmacht of, you know, that the, the, it was only the SS uh, or, you know, select units who were responsible for you know, atrocities and crimes against humanity. And these were just soldiers in between a rock and a hard place and who you should feel, you know, sorry for or feel sympathy towards. And I feel that you do. I don't think the the film really makes you feel any sort of uh, sympathy for the German cause, but it right. certainly doesn't bear out. And then also talking about the violence on the Eastern Front, you know, there's no civilians really depicted in this film. Right. That civilian mm-hmm. vi- directed violence is, is absent. So had that been put in place, maybe we wouldn't view them with as much sympathy as we do when, you know, they meet their end. You only see that in the closing credits. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the closing credits has some snapshots of... Uh, Atrocities uh, committed against civilians and crying children and all the rest. So that seems almost like an afterthought. I think I think you nailed it there, Colin. I, I don't think I don't think he's trying to, to make the German cause be sympathetic by any by any way or means. But I mean, you know, no. Were, were there were there all were there every German soldier a Nazi? Of course not. You know, were there a lot of draftees? Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> quite quite a quite a few. And you know, did, were were there guys like Private Deeds? Yes, absolutely. Were there guys like Sergeant Steiner? Yeah, you know, and what's what's the um, the not the actual Nazi, the party member? What's his name in the movie? It's like Kroll or something like that. I, I don't. Zoll. Who has Zoll. 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 That's it. Yeah. The the one at the end and the uh, rapist. And, yeah. The rapist. And it's a grisly end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well deserved, but but uh, he, you know. They they all detest him, and to mm-hmm. your point, Ed, you know mm-hmm. they're they're showing you know we hate the party and all this other stuff. And there's actually a speech in there where Stronsky and Steiner, for the only time in the film, actually agree. You know mm-hmm. that they're not they they're not. Stronsky says he's a Prussian aristocrat, he's a Prussian officer, he's not a party member, he's not a Nazi, and all this other stuff. And Steiner even says, for for once, we agree. Yeah, and. Uh, I think to a point that, that that is true for not certainly not all of the German army, but you know, I mean, I knew several German soldiers who, whether they you know became anti-Nazi in 1952 or they were anti-Nazi in 1943, you know, they were for the most part they were regular guys, and you know, I, I don't know the pros and cons of this. I think are it can be blurred because mm-hmm. you know you're making an American make well mm-hmm. uh, you're you're making a movie that's you know not necessarily glorifying the German cause or not the, not the cause but the German soldier but you're showing them in a, in a relatable light whereas I mean again I don't know any any movie made before that that does that yeah. I mean that's you know I mean do, does anybody here know you know none come to mind and, and this film actually was a bigger success in Germany yeah, than hit. it was in the United well, States that, that makes sense yeah. frankly and, yeah which and, I think says a lot about yeah. it yeah and Willy Heinrich's novel was a was a bestseller in Germany he he had uh, fought as a member of a Jaeger division I think the 102nd um, was wounded five times good lord fighting on the eastern front so he was definitely there he modeled it after his own experiences and and the novel which I remember very powerfully it, it has a different ending from the movie the novel tries to separate the the German soldier from the Nazi ideology and it presents the German soldiers as ultimately being victims who were kind of swallowed up in something that that was not of their making uh, and it presents their sacrifice as being you no know, a sacrifice to an evil cause but still a sacrifice uh, so you know it, it emerges out of that that time period in german history and see that's where i think we can we could get into a really complicated discussion because i mean we all know that the german army was just as guilty as the ss and everybody else they 
got Hitler into power and, you know, left him there. And, and so, I mean, it was, it, they, they're just as much to blame as anybody else. But I think, you know, the individual, the private Dietzes of the, of the German army, they were, they were innocent. You know, I mean, they were swept up in this whole mm-hmm. thing. Which they couldn't do anything to get out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, it, it is what it is. But I, th- I think it's, you got to kind of take your own personal view. But you also have to contrast it with actual history. Is that you know the German army was just as guilty as anybody else was. So, so uh, the movie is called Cross of Iron. What is the Iron Cross, and how does one particularly obtain this Cross of Iron, Colin? Uh, well, it's it's an older award. It's a Prussian award. It originated in the sort of German wars of liberation against Napoleon in the eighteen you know, teens, eighteen thirteen, I think. Uh, and it was awarded in the Franco-Prussian War, World War One, World War Two. It's for acts of bravery, uh, sort of you know vaguely defined. Uh, it was some civilians were awarded it as well, uh, uh, but mainly for bravery on the battlefield. I, f- I found it kind of a weird plot device, honestly, uh, given that you know the Iron Cross, at least the Iron Cross second class, was there were millions of them mm-hmm. given out, yeah. or in the first class, you know, hundreds of thousands. But it was it seemed strange as. You know the sort of the ultimate goal of Stronsky is to to you know win this uh, this commendation, this medal that you know were g- given out by the millions. Right. Yeah. I, if if anything, you would think he would have striven to be awarded the Knight's Cross. You know, which yeah. is that well, there's variations of the Knight's Cross, different grades, but and that was the that was the big one. But they were you had to receive them in order. Correct. You couldn't just jump to the top right. of of the. The commendation. So right. that's that's the thing I found funny is like he wants to, you know, obtain this award, but you got to start at the bottom of the one they <laughs> hand out like candy. So it, right. I think, uh, yeah, it is a little bit weak there that it's not like you said, Seth, going for the highest version of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, oh. mo- the movie uh, leads Stronsky to a fairly extreme act of betrayal. His pursuit mm-hmm. of the Iron Cross is so obsessive. It's not presented quite as starkly in the novel. It's presented with a certain degree of sympathy in, in the novel, which is not really there in the movie. Yeah, and in the, I do like the point where Steiner pulls the EK-1 <laughs> off of his pocket. He's <laughs> like, you're going to have one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Worthless piece of metal. That's yeah. it. So, that's it. So um, the film mentions, and, and this is a rough quote. It's not verbatim, but it says, German soldiers have no ideals. They don't fight for the party or ideals. They fight for each other. And I think that's um, Colonel Brandt who actually says that to Stronsky near the beginning of the film. And, uh, and this is – that's true in all wars. And I'm not just saying German soldiers. Soldiers, yeah. period. Uh, you know, I, maybe in the beginning of wars, soldiers do fight for ideals. You know, I mean, you cannot tell me. I know for a fact that, that, that the American servicemen who were fighting after Pearl Harbor, they were fighting to avenge Pearl Harbor. I mm-hmm. mean, that's, that is a fact. But – uh, the United States Marine on Saipan in 1944 was more than likely not fighting to avenge Pearl Harbor. He was fighting for the guy sitting next to him in the foxhole next to mm-hmm. him or, you know, Joe back there in the mortar position. You know, that that's the kind of thing that they were fighting for. Um, but this is especially true with Steiner's men. Why do you guys think that is the case? I, again, I have my own theories on this. And then one of the theories is, is because it, you get the impression that these guys have been together for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, how long? I don't know. I mean, it, it could have been, you know, one campaign or it could have been since Barbarossa. You know, it could have been since 41. I find that highly unlikely that they all could have stayed alive mm-hmm. for that long. Although they do show several of the guys with, with wound badges and they're not the black ones. They're the silver ones, which means they've been wounded at least, what is it, five times, I think, to get the silver wound badge? Something like that. Yeah. Multiple wounds. So it, it's it's you know it's implied that they've been together for a very long time. Yeah, and Steiner's group only has one replacement uh, in in the movie, whereas in reality, of course, these German units had a tremendous amount of turnover. There would have been lots of replacements coming in and out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but the they were fighting with their backs to the wall. Uh, there was a sense that this is survive, which is a very slight chance, or or die. Uh, the Russian troops are, I think, presented pretty realistically, although what we don't see is even among 
common German soldiers viewed the Soviets with a, a mixture of fear and contempt, uh, which you you can see in in just average uh, soldiers' accounts. The their their human wave attacks, a sense that they were in some degree barbaric. Um, doesn't quite come across in the movie, but you do get the sense that they really have, the Germans have no other options. They expect they're going to die, but at least they'll die with each other. Yeah, I, I think that the fact that they, you know, we talked about it earlier when Steiner bails on the hospital and goes back to the front and he's elated to be with his people. That's his family now. And, and that, that's very, very true. And again, it's a cliche that, that's popular in today's movies, but not so much then that they're yeah. fighting for each other. They're not fighting for... Uncle Addie back there in Berlin, they're yeah. fighting for, you know, Steiner and, and, you know, Dietz and all the rest of those guys. They're, they're fighting to save their lives and to keep them alive as long as they buy. That's, that's Steiner's ultimate mm-hmm. goal is to keep all these guys al- alive as long as he can. Yeah. And each time one of them dies, he brings the uh, Erkundungsmarke, the, the, the dog tag, which he actually does it incorrectly. He brings the whole thing. He's only supposed to bring half. And uh, he drops it off to... Uh, I guess it's Stronsky. Oh, no, it's uh, Lieutenant um, Meyer Meyer. Mm -hmm. in the beginning of the film. And, you know, it's he he does it in in a a very painful way. He's not crying when he hands him over, but it's just like, here's another one. Mm -hmm. We lost two more. And I I think to Ed's point, when he said when you said Ed that um, they were kind of fighting with their backs against the wall. I think at this point, a lot of these guys were probably so disillusioned and had so little faith in the German war machine. You know, we're supposed to be these top guys. Well, why are we getting pushed back? Why are we retreating? That they probably felt, like you're saying, they're the only ones that could keep keep it going. They were their only way out of there. And they'd lost faith. And, and you can clearly see they've lost faith in their superior officers. They did not trust the higher-ups. Any of them. Except for the lieutenant. Yeah. Lieutenant Meyer. And one of them said he had been in the Stalingrad pocket, uh, hadn't he? I can't recall mm-hmm. which yeah, one. Yeah, that was... Uh, the really nasty guy, Kruger. The Kruger, really, that's right. The filthy, dirty, the waterproof. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a duck. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the ultimate That's the ultimate take on this is that, you know, they are they have no hope of getting out of anything. The only way you're getting out of there is in a pine box or, or stuffed in a hole in the ground. That, that's it. And they realize that. And the only thing you can do is to continue the fight and continue to support one another. So... Um, Cross of Iron is based on the 1955 novel, as we talked about, The Willing Flesh, by German Wehrmacht veteran Willi Heinrich. He writes with sympathy for his fellow veterans, but also conveys the hopelessness of fighting on the Eastern Front, like we just talked about. Is there a realistic balance in conveying the German soldier's experience? Ed, what do you think? It's it's just very hard to do. Uh, it's very easy to go from one extreme to the other to portraying it almost as a, a cliche, like we're all going to die, and what's the point anyway, versus portraying it as a campaign of evil against good or, or good against evil. Uh, how do you how do you present the war and how do you present the the German soldiers' experience on the Eastern Front uh, in a realistic, balanced way that's that's free of ideology? I don't know that anybody has done that done that yet. There have been a number of films uh, about the Eastern Front uh, from Partisan with Daniel Craig recently. Was it called Partisan? Um, or um, something like that. Stalingrad. <laughs> um, each one of those, to, to some degree, falls victim to, to cliché. Uh, and this movie does as well to some degree. But, but it doesn't do that badly. It tries to strike a balance. Stalingrad is one um, that was made in what, like ninety two, I think ninety two, ninety three, something like that. And that that movie is a bit um, to the extreme of being, in my opinion, being apologetic, in, mm-hmm. in that they make a lot of the characters to be these just whining, sniveling rats. And I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not really sure what the goal of that was or what the point of all that was, but. Visually, it's a cool-looking movie, but it, that, that's that's about it as far as Stalingrad is, in my opinion. Anyway, I, I just I don't really, I don't I don't I don't know. That's that's not Das Boot, as you mentioned earlier. It's yeah. a different, not Eastern Front, obviously, but that's that's I think a more realistic representation of the German experience. That anyway. may be the best in in my view, uh, a, a movie presenting the German experience mm-hmm. uh, of World War Two. 
there was a mini series that came out, and I think we've talked about it a little bit here and there. Um, Generation War. Yeah. That's the American translation mm-hmm. of it. It was a German produced like three part miniseries. Has anybody seen that? I've here? seen seen episodes. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's really good. It has its it it too <laughs> has its cliched moments as well, and it also has its lies as well. You know, but. Uh, but overall, I think that's that's a pretty good representation of, of, of German soldiers' lives on the Eastern Front. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's worth the time for sure. But uh, what do you? What does anybody else think about that? I mean, is you know, is there a realistic balance in conveying it? I think there's just so many different perspectives, and I mean, you're trying to show the different views. Yes, you had the ones who joined up because they were idealistic, but then as time went on, they became completely disillusioned. You have those that from the beginning to the end, they were you know, ardent believers. I think it's really hard to put that in a movie without it beginning to feel cliche, mm-hmm. that these characters are cliches or they're these, you know, you, you're trying to pack all of that into a handful of individuals that it, it just kind of seems a little disjointed at times, mm-hmm. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I think the building of what Kaylee said, I think it's explaining it well. It's, I think all you know, veteran accounts, even if they're in a novel form, are, are, are valuable, especially those from the, the rank and file. If I if I'm reading, uh, you know, Company H by you know Sam Watkins, you know the Civil War memoir of a, a rank and file soldier in the Army of the Tennessee, I'm looking to get certain things out of it, not larger political and ethical uh, implications. I'm looking to see what a day to day life of a Confederate soldier in the Western theater have been like. So. Um, Maybe just, you know, what you can get out of these accounts and just pare it down to, you know, sussing out, you know, fact versus fiction. It's very, very difficult, but at least having some degree of fact you're being left with. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Orson Welles called the film, quote, the best war film he had seen about the ordinary enlisted man since all quiet on the Western Front, end quote. Do you agree? Has Cross of Iron influenced other action films? And Colin, I'll start with you. Well, Tarantino liked it. I mean, that's the the big one, I think, right? That mm-hmm. everyone you know points to. He likes it for Inglorious Bastards, uh, uh, which you can definitely see just sort of the gratuitousness of of, of this film and that. Uh, but I, I, I think Ed was talking about it. I mean, for me, I see the influence of the thirty version of All Quiet on the Western Front on this film, even down to some of the dialogue when they show Dietz. It's like they're sending babies to us. I mean, that's they say that in All Quiet as well. So this is a it's a fun movie to look at. Like you know, who's stolen from it or lifted from it, but then also where Peck and Paul was just you know blatantly taking from too. Hmm. Kaylee. I don't know if I can say it's the best war film about um, ordinary enlisted men, but you know it definitely does get across that hopeless perspective that you get in a lot of accounts, and just that that you are kind of a cog in a big machine, and your existence is kind of up to the to other people, and so much of it is out of your control. But you Ed. I don't think it comes close to being the best uh, depiction of the ordinary enlisted man's experience since All Quiet on the Western Front. There are quite a, quite a good number of other movies that, that present the enlisted man sympathetically uh, from multiple nations. Could give a long list. Which is not to say it's, it's an enjoyable movie. It, it has a lot of good points to it, um, but it, it, it strays a bit too far into the realm of, of cliche, you know, with the different characters in the platoon uh, for, for my liking. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Ed. I don't, I don't think it's the best war film that portrays the enlisted man at all. You know? I, mean, I, spe- I mean, I know Orson Welles was commenting on his time mm-hmm. and what had been made, you know, from 1977 back but i mean you know if you look at it in today's light i mean it's not even close a good movie yeah and we'll get to our summarizations here in just a minute but it is good it is enjoyable i agree with that 100 percent. but also uh, like you said it i know it it is not (laughs) the 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 best uh representation of the uh, of the life of the enlisted man in world war ii i mean and again you know what are you trying to represent are you trying to represent the Pacific? Are you trying to represent the American experience, the British experience, the, the life in the air? You know, it, it, you got you to look at all that. And I mean, there's a number that we've already done on this podcast that, that I think are better representations of the enlisted, or certain aspects of it, better representations of the enlisted man's experience in World War II. Um, 
not saving Private Ryan either. <laughs> I'll just say, agreed. But uh, but there's a few, you know. I mean, twelve o'clock high is one mm-hmm. for for the Army Air Forces. That's it's not necessarily the enlisted man, but it's the fighting man. And you know, when they're all ten guys and a B seventeen, it doesn't matter who the hell you are. They're all going to go down if the thing goes down. More than likely, um, you know, uh, battleground sands yeah. of Iwo Jima, uh, the story of GI Joe. Those those especially the story of G.I. Joe shows, you know, the plight of the enlisted man in, in the Italian theater and the North African theater in World War II from Ernie Pyle, of all people's point of view. It's a great, great film. And I think it shows a little bit better. Now, however, this movie does, I think, show the misery mm-hmm. better than all of those combined. I really do. I mean, just these guys are living in squalor and filth and grime and just, na- I mean, God, there's a scene, a comedic scene, where they're picking lice off of one another, <laughs> and the guy slugs him in the shoulders like, leave my lice alone. Another one's saying, these are mine, leave them alone. <laughs> and that's a real thing, you know? Yeah. And, and these guys are, I mean, they're just, they're they're covered in filth and grime and gross, and, and that's an accurate representation of not only the Eastern Front, but of infantry combat period and i think it does a very good job of that so uh, as far as influenced other action films i can honestly say i have never seen inglorious bastards and i'm not a huge fan of quentin tarantino so i can't really say it's going to be high on my list but i guess i'll have to check it out sooner or later the uh the overdone blood pack explosions made me think of tarantino definitely the the that's kind of one of his trademarks is the gore is a little bit excessive dr- dramatic and so mm. I definitely saw that there probably the the best action sequence in this movie takes place toward the end when Steiner's uh, squad has been left behind and they're retreating through a factory complex and they come under attack by a group of T-34s um, mm-hmm. w- which I thought was really well done I saw some echoes of that in the later scenes of Saving Private Ryan I don't know if that was conscious or not but no, of the of the tanks uh, driving up over piles of rubble uh, and all the rest, <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought was was really quite quite well done. Yeah, they they uh, got to have a lot of fun with those tanks smashing yeah. through those buildings. <laughs> that's for sure, especially in that factory. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's pretty. That pretty, was that was a cool scene. Yeah. Well, yeah, no doubt, no doubt, they were laying waste inside that factory. Well, um, let's wrap this sucker up, Colin. I'm going to start with you. Did you like it, and would you recommend it? Uh, if you're going to see a 70s Peck and Paul movie, I'd say see Straw Dogs first. Uh, it's just as violent, but much, much better, uh, in my opinion. I, I think I would recommend it, I guess, since we all kind of talked around the horn about it. It's one of the, I guess, earliest films that sort of, for English language films at least, that presents sort of the Eastern Front. So I think it's mm-hmm. important and interesting for that. Um, the beginning and middle are good. The end just seems to went on forever. It just seems like they had like we've got a bunch of unexploded TNT that we have to use. <laughs> it was like watching like car crash footage by the end of it. Uh, but no, the the beginning and middle are, are really strong. And yeah, as an de- early depiction of you know Eastern Front combat, I think it's 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 worth checking out. He said yes. He I said yes. He said yes. He said yes. yes. He said yes. <laughs> Say it louder. <laughs> Kaylee. Perhaps. You? <laughs> she said yes, too. She said yes, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like it. Um, I definitely think that as far as the fact that there are few films from the German perspective, it's worth viewing um, for what it's worth. It's it's an important piece of film there. Ed? If you're a war movie buff, I'd say watch it. You'll enjoy it. If, if you like interesting battle scenes and you're into the equipment and there's some good acting, um, Colin, to your point about the end, uh, one of the amusing facts about this movie, a couple facts. First of all, that Peckinpah was flat out drunk most of the time that he was directing it. Uh, And second, that he spent so much money on those explosions uh, that he ran out of money uh, toward the end. So the the end has is very odd. I won't give any spoilers away, but but it seems strangely truncated. And uh, there are certain things that happen at the end which he would have reshot but he couldn't because he didn't have the funds to do it and he was running out of film uh so (laughs) that makes it it's a it's an odd movie and it's a campy movie uh but i think it's worth watching yeah i agree it's 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 a good movie it's enjoyable is it a history lesson you know we always say you know josh coined the term history josh and this is history seth is it a history lesson no is it an, an enjoyable film yes absolutely it, it is it is enjoyable there are times in the movie 
where I'm like, come on, let's go, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> one more explosion, you know, one, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, all right, let's go get a gun. But, um, but overall, yeah, it's an enjoyable movie. I hadn't seen it in a while. Uh, I'd seen it many times before. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I like it. I would recommend it, you know, and, and to your point, Colin, I, I would recommend, uh, Oh damn, the western! I just uh, wild, wild bunch. bunch. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd recommend yeah. wild bunch if yeah. you want to watch the a Dogs movie. Is great too, yeah. Um, but this is a good one. It's a good flick. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. Ed, can you sum it up in a sentence or two? Uh, slaughter saga uh, of the Eastern Front, um, and um, if you if you like uh, war memoirs, a forgotten soldier by Guy Guy C.J. Uh, is kind of a parallel to this. It's just a great ultra violent action movie. Kaylee, uh, it's a reminder that despite any ideology they may have, that the enemy is human. I think it kind of brings that back into perspective that a lot of German films, a film show Germans just as faceless evil. And this reminds you that they were human. Yep. No doubt. Colin. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like any fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was part, probably the point. And uh, I would agree with that. Uh, my final thoughts, I usually pull a quote, and I think this one's going to be obvious for this one. It says, come with me and I'll show you how a Prussian officer can fight. Come with me, and I'll show you where the iron crosses grow. One of the coolest lines in movie history right there. And with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to hear more about the events we discussed today, tune in to our mini-episode next week. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on Stitcher and iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Mallory Kirk, and our sound engineer, Jeremy Burson. This has been a production of the National World War II Museum. <laughs>